All right. So hello again and welcome to everybody who is joining us tonight for um, an event, as I was saying to Meg earlier, uh, an event I've been super excited about collaborating on for, for a couple of months now. We planned it before uh, the new year, um, before January. So thrilled to be here tonight partnering up with um, Monkey, which is based here in Pittsburgh, to launch their second volume of new and translated Japanese literature, Travel. Uh, so we're joined um, pre-recorded in spirit by Aoko Matsuda, Holly Barton, and editor Fando, founder Moto Shibata, who will actually be live tonight um, handling the Q&A with us. Uh, so they'll be uh, in, a, in an exclusive pre-recorded interview in just a, a couple of minutes. And after that, we'll have a conversation with contributor Adam Sachs and uh, managing editor Meg Taylor. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A with Adam, Meg, and Moto. So yeah, I really appreciate uh, everybody being here and signing up. So a little bit about myself and about Whitewell Bookstore quickly before I turn it over to Meg to um, introduce this a little bit further. I'm Anna, I'm the events director at Whitewell Bookstore. So we have folks tuning in from a lot of different time zones across the world, which is so exciting. So, I mean, good evening here. Good morning to some of you. Good middle of the night to other folks. Uh, so Whitewell Bookstore is a family owned general interest independent store located in the Bloomfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, in the US on the East Coast. Uh, and our store motto is conversation, community and culture. We strive to be a home for book lovers. So our events programming features local, national and international writers, editors, and translators reading, discussing, and celebrating literature of all genres and for all ages. So a few events coming up that we think you might be interested in if you're here with us tonight. So next Tuesday, March 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern time, um, it's another cross time zone event that I'm really excited about. We're thrilled to virtually host Nana Dakoa Sekiyama, author of The Sex Lives of African Women, Self-Discovery, Freedom and Healing for a virtual conversation uh, next week, next Tuesday. And she'll be joined by Hannah Echo, who will be the author of Honey is a Knife. That's a book coming out this year. And next Thursday, March 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we're so excited to celebrate new and recent short story collections out from a couple of small presses that we really adore. So join us online to celebrate I'm Not Hungry, But I Could Eat by Christopher Gonzalez, Manywhere by Morgan Thomas, Admit This to No One by Leslie Pietrick, and Jerks by Sarah Lipman. So that's all next week. You can find out more about those events and many other events we have coming up on our website, whitewellbookstore.com. So a couple of notes about our Zoom settings before I turn it over to Meg. Um, so we're gonna keep everybody's video and audio off for the duration of the meeting. Uh, that'll just be easier to focus on um, our contributors and on the video. There, the chat is open so you can message me. So please do feel free to say hello, um, tell us where you're tuning in from, uh, ask questions for the Q&A at the end. You can send me those questions anytime. And uh, the contributors will have a chance to look at the chat log later. So um, definitely do feel free to, to sort of chat there. Uh, I also like to point out that Zoom has this reactions button, which I, I always think is cool. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see this little smiley face with a plus sign. And if you click that, you can put emoji next to your name as we go, which, um, yeah, I think it's cool. It's a, it's a nice touch when we can't um, see everybody. Yes, thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> um, yeah, chat reactions, best viewing. I like to recommend um, hiding all of the black boxes with everybody's names. So the best way to do that is to click on the three dots on your own black box, which is probably up at the top of the screen right now, um, and then click hide non video participants. And that'll just condense the whole screen down so that it's just the videos uh, that are on. And last, not least, uh, we have Zoom's live closed captioning on tonight. That is gonna be just the English. It's gonna close caption the Japanese probably very badly. And with the English, it's maybe accurate 70% of the time. It's just their, their auto-generated captions. So if you'd like to toggle that on and off as we go along, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and then click show or hide subtitles. Okay, so that's that's all my housekeeping. So I'm gonna turn it over to Meg um, before we take a look at this conversation. Thank you all again for being here. Okay, 
Um, I'm Meg Taylor. I'm the managing editor of Monkey New Writing from Japan. I want to begin by thanking White Whale Bookstore um, for hosting this event. Um, they're great fans of Japanese literature. From the first time I walked into the store, I, I saw Japanese books featured everywhere, and, and uh, especially Mieko Kawakami and Aoka Matsuda, who's with us tonight, and Yuko Tsushima. Anna is a big fan of Yuko. Um, so we feel that White Whale is the perfect match for us launching um, volume two. And I see that many of you are logging on from Japan um, and it's already Saturday morning. So um, thank you very much for getting up early. And, uh, and also especially thank you to the people in the UK and Italy. Uh, it's the middle of the night there. And so I really appreciate you are joining us tonight. Um, Motoyuki Shibata, the founder of Monkey, will be joining us live for the Q&A. Wanted to mention that again, because if you have questions you want to direct to him, please do. Um, thank you for joining us um, really from around the world tonight. And a special shout out to Peter Goodman, the publisher at um, Stonebridge Press. We have a Monkey imprint. We're going to start publishing books with them this year. Um, I'm here in Pittsburgh with Adam Sachs. Hello. He's the author of Inherited Disorders and the Organs of Sense. Um, Adam had the pleasure of meeting Alko Matsuda and monkey editors Motoyuki Shibata and Ted Gustin when they were here in 2017. In 2018, Alko's translations of uh, Adam's short stories appeared in the Japanese edition of Monkey. So that was, that was very exciting. We're gonna talk about that later. Adam and I will reappear after the recording to talk about his experience being translated and his thoughts on the importance of translated literature. So I hope you enjoy Moto's uh, interview with Alko Masada and her translator, Polly Barton in the, in the UK. She's in Bristol. Uh, they will be doing a bilingual reading at the very end of a short, short story that appears in volume two of Monkey called The Most Boring Shade of Red. If you, if you have a copy, you can look it up. Okay, back to you, Anna. Awesome, thank you so much, Meg. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this video on screen for us. Okay, and then if folks could just, if a couple of people could just send me sort of a thumbs up, either with the reactions or send me a quick message in the chat, just let me know that you can hear and see this okay. All right, here we go. Hello, uh, my name is Moto Shibata. I'm one of the three editors of the Monkey Magazine. Um, I have a very fond memory of launching uh, the final issue of Monkey Business, uh, our previous magazine in Pittsburgh, back in 2017. And I'm very happy to be back, so to speak, even if it's only uh, virtually. I'm talking to you from uh, Tokyo, and this evening I have invited two of our monkey regulars, Aoko Matsuda, an author from Tokyo, and Polly Barton, a translator from Bristol. As some of you may know, uh, this book, Where the Wild Ladies Are, uh, written by Aoko, and, oh, this is the Japanese original, and uh, written by this Aoko. Is the US oh, that, that's the uh, US yeah. version. Yeah. <laughs> edition and uh, uh, translated by Polly. Uh, this book was the winner last year of the uh, World Fantasy Award in the best story uh, collection category. So I'd like to congratulate both of you once again on winning the award. So probably uh, could we start uh, by asking how you feel about uh, winning the award? Uh, uh, could you start Aoko? Okay, so it was so, I mean, like it was totally unexpected and I was so surprised. But when I write, when I wrote this short story collection, I really wanted to make it very joyful and playful and uh, using various forms of writing. So I guess this award is one more joyful moment. I, I mean, one more joyful element added to where the white ladies are, mm -hmm. I guess. And I'm very grateful to Polly for translating my Where the White Ladies Are. Thank you so much, Polly. 
Okay, so how, how do you feel about how do you feel about it, Polly? <laughs> Similarly to alcohol, I, it was really unexpected. Um, I mean, I think for two reasons, just winning an award was unexpected, but also I think the fact that it was fantasy. Mm. Um, like, you know, in my head, I guess I'd never really classified where the world ladies are as fantasy. I'd heard it spoken of before as speculative fiction and that kind of, I hadn't really seen it um, in that way either. But then when I, you know, I think that can be one of the nice things about awards and, and these kind of labels in a way, because they, they do sort of open up a new aspect to it. And, and, you know, if someone were to say to me, why isn't it fantasy? I couldn't give a reason. It, it, you know, it, obviously it, it fits very well in that category in a way. It's just my ideas about, it's different to what I conceive of as, you know, fantasy as I know it within a, an English speaking market, I guess. Mm, right, yeah. And all the stories in Where the Wild Ladies Are, uh, they are based on traditional uh, Japanese ghost stories. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask Aoko how you came up with the idea of doing a sort of new take on the uh, those uh, traditional tales. You know, what, what, what made you, you know, do that? Um, like from my childhood, I've always loved Japanese traditional ghost stories and especially Japanese like female ghosts and monsters. So, but like, as I grew up, I somehow noticed that in those stories, women are kind of treated very badly, uh, like as if they have no rights. So I have some kind of mixed mixed feeling towards them. Mm. Like I love them, I love reading them, but in the same at the same time, I feel very sad and so so and feel so sorry for the women who had no choice but but to turn into the ghost or the monsters. So what I wanted to do is to revise them and make a safer, make, make a safer place for female ghosts and make them happy. And with the process of writing it, I was able to feel happiness too. So mm. <laughs> this is kind mm. of happy, I mean, like experience for, for me. Wow. That's also, again, a joyful uh, element of the book. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, as you said, you know, J Japanese uh, women in those traditional ghost stories are treated really badly. I mean, we've been knowing those stories for, for a long, long time, but somehow we, we never really realized it. But uh, 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 these days we are finally beginning to uh, mm -hmm. notice it and, uh, uh, Polly's uh, brief introduction to uh, each story uh, makes it very, very clear. Uh, for instance, uh, she writes uh, about a story called My Superpower. Uh, Polly writes, Oiwa is the star of arguably the most famous Japanese ghost story of all time, Yotsuya Kaidan, when the family of Oiwa's suitor, Iemon, decide that he should marry someone else, they send her face cream laced with poison to disfigure her. Repulsed by Oiwa's transformed countenance, Yemon asks his brother Takuetsu to rape her to give him grounds for divorce, not having etc. etc. <laughs> yes. um, so can I ask Polly, uh, all the stories uh, in, uh, in, in this book are based on Japanese ghost stories and uh, your brief introduction uh, to each story is immense help to uh, English readers who are not familiar with the uh, uh, context. Uh, was there anything else you did to make the stories more accessible to, uh, to the English speaking readers? Um, thank you for that. I mean, I think I should say kind of, I should preface this answer by saying that, you know, the, the decision to include those introductions came out of a discussion with, well, first of all, with um, Tilted Axis, the UK publisher, and with Alco. Um, and I worked, you know, quite closely with Alco in creating them. And then, it, and actually, so in the UK 
version, only some of the stories have introductions, one, the ones where we felt it was kind of mm. necessary um, or helpful, and they came before the individual stories. Um, and so I wrote introductions for more of them and then had discussions with editors, and one of my editors was keen to sort of have as few introductions as possible. So some of the things that were in my introduction then got incorporated into the stories where that could mm. happen. And then when it came to the publication of the US version, I spoke to my editor there, Yuka, and she was very keen to have introductions to all the stories, but at the back uh -huh. of the book. So, it, you know, so I, I suppose I'm saying that because it was, it was very much a process of, of kind of reckoning with how much of this information should actually be, you know, done through the translation itself, supplemented kind of on a sentential level, and how mm. much should we just kind of put in. Um, so yeah, so there are some, there are some stories, I definitely did do some adding in of things. Um, mm. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> It's interesting this question of accessibility because I, in a way, I sort of feel like the job of a, a good translator is to make things accessible, you know? Mm. Like the, the stories are accessible to the Japanese reader. And so if I'm doing my job well as a translator, then they will be accessible to the English reader. But that in, in this case, when there's a lot of kind of history in the background that needs yeah a few there's, there's a few tricks that <laughs> mm, yes you know no, notes and uh, introductions uh make the stories more accessible in terms of uh uh information but uh, in, in english-speaking countries uh notes and and you know those introductions uh seem to uh sort of uh drive some readers away i mean you know make the stories more more uh, inaccessible, somehow, you know, seeming uh, reader unfriendly or or more academic. Uh. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, one of mm. the, the first discussions was like, should we have introductions or should we have footnotes? And you know, everyone mm. was like, no footnotes. No, you know, footnotes were off the table from the beginning uh. because, like Alka said, this is by its nature such a joyful. Mm. collection and I think we've reached a point where most people feel that footnotes are incompatible with joy mm. basically mm. right yeah. right yeah but yeah can, can you hear hear that that my kids is, is kind of crying out while loud no oh, uh actually no yeah oh, okay, oh, okay. Should, should, uh, should, should you go go to no, no, no. He just oh, woke up oh, and him. my mother is taking care of it. I oh, think good, good. Good. <laughs> no, not <laughs> him. Okay, that's good. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, so, um, so Alko, now you have you have a uh, uh, the audience readership in English speaking countries too. Uh, do you feel there is if there is any uh, you know significant difference between the way your work is received in Japan and the way your work is received in English speaking countries? Well, one thing that I I found very fascinating is that. Basically, they are pretty much the same. Mm. You know, like for where the white lady, ladies are, they are both enjoyed how playful it is mm. and said how they can relate, relate it to the stories. And I thought this is so great because even though it is revised with modern twist, for their people of English play, English speaking countries, it could be very like reading about Japanese traditional ghost stories could be very boring or like mm. they have nothing to relate it to, but it turns out very differently. So I think it's it's like yeah, I'm very relieved and glad about mm. it. Mm. Mm. So, Polly, uh, what is special about uh, Aoko, you know, translating Aoko's work? You translated this book and uh, you translated other pieces, including the uh, two short pieces for the uh, uh, Monkey One and Monkey Two. Yeah. Um, 
I suppose I feel like, especially with the, where the world ladies are, but kind of with everything that I'll co writes, it, you know, this this sense of it's not quite humor. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, obviously, it includes humor, but it, to me, it sort of feels bigger than that. Um, mm. Sort of fun, joyfulness, playfulness, inventiveness. Um, I feel like capturing that sense of it is very high up on my list of priorities when I'm um, translating Alco, which I think, you know, in at, at times, um, sort of remembering that can. You know, obviously, I, I try to be as faithful to the Japanese on a kind of sentential level where I where I can and where that works. But I think mm -hmm. at the times when I feel like it's not quite working because the playfulness feels quite high up on my mm -hmm. priority list, I you know I I feel more empowered to to go a bit more off the rails sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then if I mm -hmm. want to go really off the rails, then I will check with Alco and make sure that she's okay with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, sometimes, you know, Aoko makes fun of a of a of a Japanese cliche, you know, set mm -hmm. phrase, and uh, and so she sort of you know twists it around and uh, you know turns it in, into something completely else, uh, just as she uh, uh, turned uh, ghost uh, Japanese ghost stories into something joyful. Uh, did you sometimes have difficulty with dealing with those, you know? very Japanese phrases? Yeah, I think that I do, I have had difficulty in the past, but I think I haven't yet tackled one of the Alco stories that the whole thing is based around one of these uh, phrases, which has no equivalent in English or, uh, you know, and I, I still want to try one of those. Um, uh, There's a couple I really love, but I, I still, they're kind of in the back of my mind. And I think like, can I make this work? And some days I feel like I could, and other days I feel right, like it. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Uh, back in 2007, she, uh, Aoko was in Pittsburgh too. And uh, uh, she did a wonderful conversation with the author of this book, uh, Disinherit uh, Inherited Disorders by Adam Sachs. And uh, this is, book is a, is a, is a, uh, a collection of very short stories about father and son. And uh, Aoko translated some of the, she, she's a wonderful translator too. Aoko translated some of the stories in this book for the Japanese uh, version of the of the Monkey Magazine. And she also wrote a, a short story of her own, a sort of uh, uh, a parody of, of, uh, of uh, these uh, stories. It, and it's called uh, Chichito Senaka, Father and His Back. Am I, am I right? Is that Chichito Senaka? Yes, Chichito Senaka. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And uh, <laughs> uh, that's uh, based on uh, uh, Japanese uh, phrase, Chichi no Senaka o mite sodatsu, grow up for a son to grow up uh, looking at uh, her, uh, his, his or, or his father's, oh, it could be about a daughter too. So uh, uh, a child to grow up uh, looking at their father's back meaning sort of learning uh, silently uh, I mean you know not without really being told by by their father but uh, uh, seeing how their father behaves and they learn and grow up and uh, uh, you sort of uh, turning turn it into a joke and uh, uh, write about uh, a father who tries never to show his back to yes. his son. And, um, are you very conscious about uh, uh, sort of making a parody of those, uh, you know, uh, cliches and phrases? Oh uh, yeah, and for the for the piece, I, I wrote, I mean, like I was trying to write as funny as Adam. Mm. <laughs> so, All right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, because like there, there are many phrases and expression in Japan which are based on kind of like old, old fashioned 
thinking. I mean, like, right, kind right. of, I don't know how, how I kind of forget how to say it, like, henken. Mm, prejudice. Oh, uh, yes. Mm -mm -mm. So I kind of want, I kind of want to make fun of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, I think that's so, so that kind of double element is wonderfully captured by Polly. Uh, this translation. I mean, you on one hand you try to be as funny as Adam, <laughs> so th there is always the sense of fun in your writing. But also there is uh, uh, the element of anger about, for instance, how how the women are treated in the stories and in act reality too. And uh, and uh, you you never seem to. Uh, uh, I mean, you are so good at. at uh, doing those two things uh at the same time i mean to to be funny and uh, to show your anger and uh, and uh, criticize the, the 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 way things have been done in japan yeah. sorry it's not a question but it's, it's just just a just a uh, yeah, praise no, I guess, yeah i guess that's kind of my style or like my, mm. my thing to do that mm. yeah right yeah that's really wonderful yeah. <laughs> um um so you uh, also work as a, a translator. You have translated uh, books by Karen Russell and uh, Amelia Gray, among others. And uh, you also translated some of the stories from uh, uh, Adam's wonderful book. Um, do you think your work as a translator has affected your own writing? And also, could you uh, discuss your experience of uh, trans translating Adam's stories. So, like, as for Karen Russell and Amelia Gray and Kame Machado, I'm a, I'm a big fan of them. I love, I love them and their work so much. And I guess, yeah, they they have affected me and my works as well. Mm. But like, as an author, I believe that everything has affected me. You know, mm. like. I, everything I've experienced, like mm. read or heard or watched or anything else, else. So, yeah, I think everything has affected me. And mm. I love Adam's works as well. I mean, like, it was, as we have talked about it, his writing is very funny and very mm. unique about it. And I had a, such an exciting time to mm. catch his voice, and it was really fun. Right. Right, right. That's good. Yeah. So uh, Aoko is a, is a wonderful author and a translator as well. And uh, uh, on the other hand, or, or at the same time, uh, Polly is a wonderful translator, but uh, she's a, a writer in her own rights. And uh, her book, uh, 50 Sounds, this one, uh, came out uh, last year. And this is basically the uh, a book about the Japanese language is especially about Japanese uh, onomatope, but uh, I, I hesitate to uh, stop with that. It's because this book is um, a lot more than that. Uh, but probably I should ask Polly herself to to uh, uh, explain the book. Uh, Polly, could you briefly discuss your own book? <laughs> Yeah, sure. It's funny, you know, when it first came out, I got quite good at, at kind of giving a brief explanation of it. And I think I've, I've lost that ability now, but I'll give it a try. Um, it's So I kind of describe it as a, a personal dictionary of the Japanese language. It kind of is a, a memoir which explores my journey from, you know, discovering Japanese at the age of 21, mm. speaking none to right. kind of becoming a literary right. translator for each chapter is based around um, a particular um, experience, a particular word, onomatopoeic word. And the, the title, 50 Sounds, is a direct translation of the Japanese term, mm. for the, mm. the It's Japanese like 26 alphabet. alphabets. No. Mm. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the number of sounds that exist right. in the Japanese language. Mm. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting what Alco was saying, you know, about um, everything affects you, because I think there are a couple of times, yeah, I think it, it, throughout the course of the book, it's, you know, some of the chapters are very long and some are very short and some are, there, oh, there's quite a lot of, I wrote them in quite a lot of different voices. 
Um, and that was, it. I was writing it at a time when I was translating a, a lot of alcove and, um, you know, got quite used to writing in her voice, I think. And then there were, <laughs> would be times when I was writing, and I'm like, am I writing as me or as Alco? You know, it's like this <laughs> Alco in English is like a mode in my head that I can actually uh, do and slip into without kind of necessarily realizing it. Uh, <laughs> that's nice. Um, is the book coming out in the US? It is. It's coming out very soon, I think, in March. Oh, that's good. Um, in March. Mm. In March. Yeah, same time. That's wonderful. Okay, um, I could go on a lot more, but I think um, I should. Uh, uh, it's it's time. I ask you. I asked you to uh, uh, do a reading. Um, wonderful piece uh, for in uh, each issue of Monkey. But uh, since we are launching this new issue, uh, could we? Uh, uh, could I ask you both to read uh, the piece in this one uh, bilingually? So should I start? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The most boring red on earth. The most boring shade of red on earth is period red. How old was Rika when she came to feel that way? Hard to say. She doesn't even remember how old she was when she got her first period. She remembers being there in the toilet stall, feeling surprised, feeling embarrassed. But the memory wasn't the kind that kept its grip on her forever. When she saw a scene in a TV series written by a man showing a girl getting her first period, saw the same scriptwriter saying things in an interview like, I want the women in my work to be fully fleshed out as characters. So when I'm writing my scripts, I make sure to decide what age they got their first period. It made her smirk. This guy thinks women equals periods. Odoroita, Haskashkata toile karamo june ejo tate. Seri nakawa, Sukari minarete, mo taiste odorotimunai. So deska, de sorigurai. Taiha was then in Apukin in Kyushu Sareta today. Sonakawa akuto, Sonakawa tokute, Honto nyakadata no kayoku akarana. Aruamo nano iro demonayo. Over 10 years had passed since the surprising, embarrassing moment in the toilet, and Rika had grown thoroughly used to the red of her period. All right, I get you. That was about the size of her reaction when it came. Once most of it had been absorbed by the pad, the red seemed at a distance, so that she wasn't convinced it had ever really been red in the first place. It was no longer any colour at all. So, in the first place,理科は確信が持てなくて、とりあえず気にしないことにした。目の錯覚、目の錯覚、生活していると学校に通っていると、働いていると、自分の体は自分のものじゃないみたいに感じることの方が多かったし、自分の体に記憶ばることよりも記
生理の血がオレンジ色だった。お風呂でコンディショナーを,コンディショナーを流しているところだった。薄めに開けていた理科の目の端をオレンジ色の筋が流れていった。は理科はじゅっと目を閉じると顔にシャワーをバシャバシャ浴びた。焦って必要以上にシャワーヘッドを顔に近づけたので、バシャバシャというより直撃って感じだった。視界がクリアになると、新たなオレンジ色の流れが生まれているのが、今度ははっきりと目に映った。その流れは、理科の股の間から始まっていた。オレンジジュースだ。理科は信じられない気持ちで眺めた。よく見ると、オレンジ色の流れには繊維質が混ざり、果汁 100% かとリカはぼんやり考えた。理科の生理の血はオレンジジュースになっていた。厄介な事態の出現に対処,対処すべく、ここで目の錯覚にご登場いただき、理科は風呂場から出ると、体を拭き、下着に足を通し、ナプキンをつけ、引っ張り上げ、一丁上がりとした。Her blood was orange. There she was in the bathroom, rinsing the conditioner from her hair. When out of the corner of her eyes that were open just a crack, Rika saw a streak of orange go gliding past. Huh? She squeezed her eyes shut, holding the shower head up to her face to splash it clean. In her consternation, she brought the shower head too close, so it was less of a splash and more of an assault. When her vision cleared, she could see a new streak of orange, this time undeniable. The streak originated between her orange, between her thighs. It's orange juice. Rika stared down at the street, disbelieving. On closer inspection, there were fibrous strands in it, making her think of freshly squeezed orange juice. Her period blood had become pulpy orange juice. She ha had to find some way of dealing with this situation, and so it's just a trick of an the eye made its entrance. Rika stepped out of the bathroom, dried herself, stepped into a fresh pair of underwear. Stuck a new pad in place, pulled the underwear up, and declared the matter done and dusted. Sigi no yoru, Rika was scared to yuvene ni scatte ita. Jibun no karada o kizuka o yori mo, shui ni mei wako kake nae hou ga daiji, toyu shakai no rule ga sukkari mini tsui te ru Rika no nakade, seiri no chiga orange juice ni natta dekiroto wa, ikura nan demo hakujo no yoda ga, sude ni bojak no kanata ni atta. Tachi shigoto wa tsuraku, sore ga seiri chu tomo naruto sara ni tsuraku. 痛み止めを飲んでも不快感は消えず、血の色がどうだとかいちいちトイレ休憩のたびに確認するような余裕は理科にはなかった。仕事が第一、理科の体は静かに耐える。The next evening, Rika was lying exhausted in the bathtub. She had freely imbibed society's maxim that it was more important to not cause those around you any bother than it was to take care of your own body. And so, heartless as it might seem, The fact that her period had become orange juice was already consigned to a far corner of her mind. Working on her feet all day was hard. Doing so when she was on her period was harder. Even taking painkillers pain didn't rid her entirely of the discomfort, and she had no spare energy to be checking the color of her blood every time she took a toilet break. The job was the most important thing, because body silently endured. <laughs> 両着の悪い体育座りのような格好で、リカはお湯から頭だけ突き出ている右膝に右頬を,右頬をくっつけて息を吐いた。両ももの間から小魚が泳いでいく。小魚と並走するように先の尖った葉っぱがいくつも漂い、そこには小石が沈んでいる。浴槽のちょうど真ん中あたりに突然現れたのは、どうやら小さな川らしい。小川の色は透明で澄んでいた。ああ、これ私のせいだな。忘れていたくせに、リカは直感的にそう分かった。Her bathtub was too small for her to fully extend her legs. Sitting with them bent up in front of her, Rika rested her right cheek on her right knee, which was sticking out just above the water, and let out a sigh. Out swam a school of small fish from between her thighs. A few pointed leaves drifted out too, as if caught up in their flow. At the bottom were strewn some pebble pebbles. It seemed that a small stream had sprung up all of a sudden, right in the center of the bathtub. The water of the stream was colorless and perfectly clear. Ah, it's my period. She had been forgetting it, but now Rika somehow understood. She saw a cow on the garden in the sailing of the river. Oh, you know, Nakademo, Susie, Gede, Koishi, Gakira, Kira, Stere. 
小魚が跳ねると光が踊る。私の生理って綺麗だったんだ。リカは自分の生理の地に見とれた。これまでもこんな風に、リカの生理の地は好き勝手にしてきたのかもしれない。リカが気づかなかっただけで、リカが気づかないのをいいことに、色を変え、その時々自由にしてきたのかも。そう考えてみると、なんだかもったいなかったように思われた。Even amid the warm bath water, and the pebbles glinted. One of the fish leapt out of the water, sending sparkles of light flying in all directions. It's sort of beautiful, my period. Ika was captivated by the sight of it. Maybe all this time, a period had been playing around like this, and she just hadn't noticed. Maybe it had made the most of the fact that she hadn't noticed to change color and do exactly as it wanted. Thinking this, She came to feel she'd missed out a bit, not paying attention to it. Ogawa no Nagarega Hayakunata. Kosakuna Tachi no Nigeri on your Oyo Sokodo Age. Kawa no Nakahodo near each Nitomati, the Shirasaki of Tobitata. Nanika Hajimaru. Meo Oki Kumi Hirakuto. Rika or Rika no Seri or Chit to Mitsmeta. The flow of the stream grew faster. The, the little fish swam quicker, as if escaping. And an egret that had come to perch on a rock in the middle of the river took flight. Something was happening. Ika opened her eyes wide and stared down at her period. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so I'll turn it over to them for the conversation. Sure. So many thanks to Moto and Alko and Polly, and a special shout out to the um, video editor Lisa Kato in Tokyo. Thank you so much for for a great a great reading, a great interview. Um, I'm here in Pittsburgh with Adam Sachs, author of Inherited Disorders, a short story collection, and the novel The Organs of Sense. Um, Adam, I'd like to start by asking you um, how it feels to be translated by, by Alko in, into, um, into Japanese and, you know, what that experience was like meeting her. And, yeah, um, I mean, of course, it was a great, it was a really a big honor for her to translate me. Um, uh, yeah, so we met five years ago uh, here in Pittsburgh. I was just, we were, had the good luck to be paired up. Paired up with her, and um, um, I'm always looking for contemporary fiction to like, and I'm almost never finding it. Um, uh, so just to be sort of randomly handed someone and find that it was so good, um, so good as Oko's work is. So um, and to be sitting across from her. So, yeah, yeah. But just the random. I mean, yeah. Because I look for it and and I don't find it, yes. and then here it is, just put in my lap. Yeah. Of, like how um, strange and funny and. Um, Especially her, the sort of deceptive lightness and simplicity, and um, a kind of na naive quality, yeah. the knowing naive quality. Um, those are things that I am always sort of aiming for in my own writing, and immediately felt a um, kinship with her writing. Yeah. So it was um, really nice that she translated. And it's great to have known her for these past two years. Yeah. And then she loved Adam's work so much that she kind of you know, riffed on it in her own story, which we're hoping to, to translate into English. So sort of complete the circle. Um, and that'll be, that'll be quite, quite an amazing uh, experience for you, I think, to have that, her, her riff on your stories then translated into English because you share a, a sense of humor. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it'll come out better my sense of humor being translated like she said she caught my voice i'm sure she caught my yeah, voice it's yeah i love better. the way she said that she yeah, caught yeah. your voice and as you're saying that yeah just the, the metaphor um that she's playing with yeah. which when we heard it meant something to like when i heard it that she's uh spent her childhood watching her father's back it made me think of um thomas mann's children uh saying that they always saw their father's office door slamming shut in their face so right. i thought it was gonna immediately and my book is filled with like um moments of 
the inability to communicate with, right. your, with your dad. So that that was turned around, that that in Japanese is a um, positive positive uh, thing. Metaphors, right. yeah. yeah. Um, and I think there's something provincial about whatever I'm, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my constant need to communicate with my dad is some weird Americanism or something. <laughs> no, whereas, yeah, yeah, right, versus watching what he does, right. yes, yeah. yes. Um, has your work been translated into other languages? Um, yes, um, uh, it's my first book, it's in Polish, and um, my novel into um, Dutch, French, and it just came out in Brazil and Portuguese. Okay. Um, yeah, so not... And the stories as well? Uh, yeah, and then the individual stories um, into Japanese, into Russian, Farsi. Uh, Farsi, okay. Serber, Serber Croatian, yeah, I don't know, random, yeah. um, not the ones I would have guessed, but right, yeah. Some... Right. And then do you find that you're reaching new a new audience that way? Or do, do you um, have any sense of those, those readers out there? Uh, I don't know if they exist. That, that <laughs> given, uh, I have a sense of a small audience. <laughs> and, the, and the translator that you were in touch with, there's only one that that was asking you questions, right? And that was yeah, the, the Dutch, Dutch one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I kind of, um, well, I didn't know what to expect going into these yeah. things, but you hear about, um, yeah, working intensively with the, all the questions and yeah. stuff, and that happened once and then, in all the other cases, it was just a kind of, and even with the Oko too, just a silent. Um, yeah. And there's something nice about it. I mean, I think uh, I would have said that I wanted some uh, to participate, but then I started thinking there's no amount of participation that can make that thing mine. It's always going to be a separate thing. So maybe it should just be fully separate and the translator should have complete autonomy with it. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but um, it's not like I, I don't begrudge at all translators who don't communicate. There's something nice about that too, right, just right. having your own way with it and making of it, and it's going to be its own yeah. separate thing. And yeah. It shouldn't be trying to be the book, you know, I, you know. And has translated literature been important in your own development as a writer? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I don't think I would be a writer if not for. Um, I just don't particularly like American uh, fiction. Or, no, I mean, I like so, so what, uh, what are the influences? Um, uh, so, Ger I mean, I'm always sort of like uh, trying to insert myself into like the German uh, literary tradition, the, like Kleist, Kafka, Thomas Bernhardt um, lineage. Yeah. Uh, um, I wanted to write before really coming across, well, Kafka I've been reading early on, but um, yeah, I mean, the people I was imitating before were not uh, Nabokov and so I had other yeah. people I imitated, they, were, they, didn't, they weren't the keys to like, figuring were, out what to do. And you were reading those in English. Yeah, so I read everything in English. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I have one language, and, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm just always uh, grateful to, <laughs> to translators for doing what they do, because... Uh, um, yeah, I, I feel no particular kinship with it. Like the, I feel like I understand much more what Oko is doing than I do yeah. what American writers are. Even just she was saying in the video, um, just struck me that I want to try something. I want to do it joyfully and playfully. Mm -hmm. And it struck me every writer, that should be such a commonplace that everyone could say, but it's not. I mean, that number not. of writers yes. that yes. want to do things joyfully and playfully is yeah. vanishingly. Small. There are <laughs> there are a few American writers, some, yeah. and we do publish some of them. That's true. Yes, um, <laughs> and some of them you you admire. Definitely, yeah, yeah. No monkeys, but find some. Evan Brockmeyer right? and Brockmeyer. Um, right. Milhouser yeah. and uh, Brian Evanson, and yeah, yeah there's yeah. there's so. um, they're out there. But <laughs> I I think that we Anna we could start taking questions if you have. If you have questions for us. Sure thing. Um, let me bring Moto on with both of you. Okay. Here we are. Hey, Moto. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I've been uh, sitting back and enjoying you, enjoying <laughs> watching you talk. It's much nicer to be an audience, <laughs> to be a participant. Well, we'll I, I like to 
Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, thank everybody from uh, uh, the White World Bookstore to to make this possible. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, let's take questions. Yes, Anna, do you have any? Oh yes, uh, would you like me to hop back on? Uh, yes, to read you them? mind? Okay, great. Yeah, because I I can't see them. Oh, awesome. I can do that. Okay. As long as you don't mind if I crash uh, no, please, the party with the three of you. <laughs> um, thank you, Moto. And thank you for sharing the photo of um, our tote bag. Um, that meant you're a very lot. welcome. My pleasure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, wonderful tote bag. Yeah. Lovely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, first one I've got here is, hi, possible question. I always assumed that translators basically did straight translations, which may be expanded to cover concepts and ideas that don't translate directly. It was surprising to hear how Polly said that she added context that she wrote for the story intros. Is that normal? Moto, why don't you take that? Well, it really depends. Um, uh, and that varies from countries to countries. In Japan, um, we tend to prefer to add notes, even footnotes. Uh, um, in Japan, somehow, you know, footnotes are not enemy to, uh, to the sense of joyfulness, and uh, uh, readers uh, don't mind uh, having a lot of footnotes to, to explain things. But uh, in English-speaking countries, uh, as Paulie said, footnotes are sort of enemy to, to, uh, to the to the, uh, the pleasure of reading, and uh, they sometimes uh, uh, the, the the best way they can deal with uh, with uh, uh, problems uh, they have to explain somehow is to uh, put some uh, you know uh, information you know uh, very inconspicuously hopefully into the uh, the, the, the text itself. Uh, but uh, you, you really have to be to, to be careful about it. Like, uh, you know, if you say, you know, William Shakespeare, uh, the English uh, playwright or things like that, you know, that would uh, really uh, uh, put readers off. And, uh, but uh, they, they do sometimes add information that's not uh, in the original text, but the, uh, the, the translators judge as necessary to uh, make readers you know, aware of the uh, context, which is not, you know, uh, which uh, the original author that, uh, didn't have to explain to the original readers. Awesome, thank you. Um, so on that uh, note, we also have a question, um, sort of a different mm -hmm. tack uh, with translation in terms of the language, but um, I've so loved all the recent conversations with Jennifer Croft and Olga Tokarczuk about translation and how Olga feels Jennifer focuses most on capturing the spirit of the text instead of the literal words. Could the three of you talk a little bit more about the importance of just that, of capturing the spirit of the words versus the literal senses? And just for mm -hmm. context for folks who aren't familiar, um, Olga Tokarczuk just came out in English in the U.S. with the books of Jacob, which is like a 945 page epic translated from Polish. Uh, shall I start? Sure. Okay. Um, the, as a, you know, lit, you know, literary, literary translator's first job is not so much to convey information as to uh, convey the sense of uh, pleasure. Uh, when you read it, uh, when, when the translator uh, themselves read the text. Uh, and and the, of course, I'm using the word pleasure in, in a very wide sense. You know, the pleasure could uh, 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 contain, uh, include uh, surprise, or even in, sometimes in the sense of pain um, uh, in, a, in a revealing way. And, uh, 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 and uh, you, you use the word spirit. And I, 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 I think I'm talking about about the same thing using the word uh, pleasure, but uh, uh, one of the American terms, uh, Elliot Weinberger said the uh, faithfulness is the most overrated uh, quality in, in translation. So you could be correct, but uh, you could be no fun as a translator, you know, and, uh, and, and if you uh, lose the spirit, or which is also, which, which is of course, you know, very easy to say and, uh, and you know, uh, 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 not easily done sometimes, but the uh, uh, you, of course, 
uh, try to be correct. And uh, and uh, in in most cases, you know, if if the if the if it's a good text, it's 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 the best policy to to try to be as correct as possible. And uh, you know, you, you don't you know really have to do do anything else. But the sometimes, you know, you, I mean, you 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 always need to be aware of the possibility that uh, by trying to be uh, correct in a bad way, uh, you uh, you know lo lose the sense of uh, pleasure. You fail to convey the sense of pleasure. Sorry, I talked too much. Go ahead. Um, Megan, Adam, do you have any thoughts on that, or or you lose the sense of? Um, I was thinking of the successive waves of like Kafka translations that sort of were trying to. Yeah. You might lose the sense of strangeness. There were like mm -hmm. early translations that captured the literal meaning of the sentences, but kind of domesticated them and. Um, and later, later translators tried to catch the sort of run-on, ungrammatical quality of the castle, for example. And um, mm. uh, but, yeah. oh, I love that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, both of you, for your for your answers. Um, I love talking about translation, so it's it's a joy to hear both of you talk about it. Um, so going a little bit on a different tack, um, a question for Adam, every experience affects a writer. Has the experience of being translated changed Adam's approach to writing? Um, I know it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of a thrill when it happens and it's nice to see this thing and then like, and you don't understand the letters, but, uh, I can't read it after, and um, uh, I mean, I, I think if I spoke a different language and saw myself translated, and then it might have some uh, impact on, on the writing, but um, being this American pathetically uh, single language type that I am, it, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, it does, it gives me that gratifying feeling of being part of a, um, community that I do feel like is my actual literary community, which is not the, not the local one, but a few sort of strange, fabulous writers in various countries and um, being translated makes me feel like I'm a little bit mm. part of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's kind of encouragement, I guess. Um, uh, and, and then there's some, sometimes I will like, there'd be some review in a foreign newspaper and I'll put into Google Translate and, um, try to work out what happened to my book in that process and what was lost or what the translator added. And um, uh, yeah, so there's some fun guessing games involved, but I'm, um, I'm not sure if it's affected the writing directly. Totally. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, how do we feel about taking a couple more questions uh, before we close? Sure. Okay, cool. And maybe one or two more. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I have a question from Moto. I was familiar with the earlier publication Monkey Business. Um, yeah, which I think probably a lot of us here were. Uh, yes, 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 we got it right there. <laughs> um, can you discuss the thinking behind the reboot as just plain monkey, both what's different and what might be the same? Uh, with Monkey, uh, probably Meg could uh, discuss this to, to more, more better than I do, but uh, uh, basically uh, we are more uh, uh, conscious about about the visuals. You know, yes. with Monkey Business, you know, uh, both in the Japanese versions and the English versions, um, I basically used to think that the uh, you know the text is everything. You know, visuals are fine, but uh, but the, uh, it's literature uh, and the, and the, and, the, and the words are everything and. Uh, um, I still think, you know, words are of course important, but uh, uh, if you have a good visual, you know, uh, and you know, coupled with uh, good words, um, sometimes, you know, uh, one plus one can be more than two. And that's what we are trying to do with the monkey. Meg? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's actually, it's inspired by the Japanese uh, design. So if, yeah, I don't have one handy if, no. great. So there's the Japanese one and we use the same cover, but the, the inside is completely different. Um, but 
Moto, could you just, um, actually, you don't need to open it. If, that, if that everyone, I, not everyone has a copy, but if you do have a copy, you know that um, it's full color throughout. It's, we, we hired a, an amazing designer, Gilbert Lee, and there, yeah, it, it's just, oh. I mean, that's the graphic narrative. So of course that's color, but, but the, it's color throughout. There, there are these wonderful oh, wow. visuals throughout and it's a much larger format there again um and the designer is just you know fabulous we're very lucky to work with him Gilbert Lee in mm -hmm. Toronto so awesome um yeah they're really incredible if folks don't have um their copies of yeah of, yes. uh, of volume two and volume one um if you don't have your copies yet they're they're truly i was just talking with somebody at the store today about how wonderful they are to hold and to read and yeah absolutely and they smell good too they smell they, really they actually good. do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're very they're very crisp <laughs> okay um I think that might be a good place to end on if, if you're all comfortable with that. I just had one tiny little question for the three of you. Um, what are what are you reading these days? Uh, let's see. Um, I'm reading, a, it's like the most boring novel, I've, famously boring novel, but it was also Nietzsche's favorite novels. Uh, it's um, Adel Stifter, Adelbert Stifter, it's uh, Indian Summer. It's um, completely plotless and, uh, but kind of mesmerizing, um, but I can't recommend it, but I'm going to finish it. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. That's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I've been reading uh, William Faulkner's The Flag in the Dust. Um, um, I've been translating uh, The Port of Faulkner, which came out back in 1940s. And uh, uh, um, so I, I uh, I'm reading uh, some of uh, Faulkner's books as a, as a, as a you know, part of the project. But I like to, you know, we didn't have much uh, time to discuss Adam's books, but these two books are really great. And, uh, you know, and this is sort of, you know, uh, we, we call it uh, preaching Buddhism to Buddha. So I'm yeah, preaching this yeah. to American readers, but uh, uh, if, you know, you, you haven't read them, you know, you should, you know. Sometimes I think intelligence is an enemy to humor, but uh, with these, you know, he, he has furious, oh, uh, furious true. intelligence and furious humor. You, know, you should read them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Moto. <laughs> and Moto, you're translating Magnus Mills right now, I believe. Oh, yes, yes, I've just and finished I, it. Yeah, it's coming out next month. And I just, oh, okay, so I just ordered a copy. So that's my next book is the, what is it Good. called, vinyl? Uh, the the for, Forensic Record Society. Uh, that's uh, the yeah. one. So that's that's my that's next one. Yeah, yeah. That one. Oh, yeah. This one. Yeah. So, this you is know, not I, a re re record. Jay this is a book. It. I haven't yeah. actually opened it yet, but uh -huh. that's my next yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Especially if you're oh, familiar with the music from the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Which we do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. absolutely. I, I yeah. love um, I love hearing what people are, are into these days. So, um, yeah, especially when they're they're writers and editors that we're really honored to host. So, OK, so that um, concludes our, our Q&A and that that concludes the event for this evening. So yes. to, to folks who are RSVP'd, um, just want to say, I'll, I'll send you all an email in a couple of minutes with a link to purchase both volumes of Monkey, the US edition, um, Adam's book, uh, and Alco's book, and Polly's book. You can pre-order oh, Polly's. Yes, Polly's book. It's yes. coming oh, out. Yeah, um, yeah. 50 Sounds is, is coming yeah. out in two weeks, I believe. Yes. It's that, either it's the yeah it's just weeks. the British edition, but the 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 American uh, edition is coming out in two weeks, so you could pre-order it. Yeah. Yes, and I mean you all know now from having just heard Polly, but if if you weren't familiar with her before, she's just absolutely incredible. So that's a must mm -hmm. must pre-order. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'll send that email in just a couple of of minutes. But um, Moto, Meg, Adam, thank you so so much for um, thank you. This thank you, you, Anna. You're, you're great. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, we, we hope to host you soon. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, thanks. Anna.